we are online now hello uh, today we will be talking about ventricular septal defects transcatheter and surgical management now uh, a very brief recap about what is a ventricular septal defect ventricular septal defect refers to any communication that is present between the left ventricle and the right ventricle or in a very 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 narrow area where there is an atrioventricular part of the membranous septum a communication between the left ventricle to right atrium because the membranous part of the atrioventricular septum is also included as a part of the ventricular septum so the any communication that is from the left ventricle most of an entering into the right ventricle but occasionally entering into the atrium ventricular part thereby directly going into the right atrium which we call as the jerbo dsd is also called vsd so now this vsd is broadly uh, yeah, you know you, you grouped into a uh, 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 set of vsds that are around the inlet septum called inlet vsds a set of vsd that is above the septal band this is called as the outlet vsds we know that there is a membranous vsd which is at the junction of all these three areas and the larger area the trabecular septum so the types of classifications of the vsds are something based on geography geography means you know like uh, how where is tamil nadu where is kerala where is andhra like that so there is outlet vsd inlet vsd central vsd and muscular vsd outlet vsds are ones that are located above the y band of the septal band inlet vsds are those that are located within the confines of the septal tricuspid leaflet attachment central vsds are those that are present which are going to be located in the central fibrous trigone of the heart and muscular vsds are a large group that are present in the muscular septum again based on geography you can divide them into anterior posterior apical and midmuscular this is easy to understand then there is a morphological classification morphological classification means you go by the morphological features of the intraventricular septum so there is a morphological structure called the crista supraventricularis it is basically the posterior limb of the septal band at its superior y division which loops around the inner curvature of the heart and so vsds that are located above the crista and below the crista so that is basically on the morphology of the septum then there is an av canal type of vsd that means vsds that are uh, located in and around the atrioventricular canal and then muscular so this is morphological then there is a classification based on borders sorry based on borders so on borders what we see those which are abutting the it's going on okay those which are abutting the atrioventricular ring those which are abutting the region of aorta tricuspid tendinitis those that are abutting the aortic valve pulmonary valve are completely surrounded by a muscular border then based on the size size is basically very variable yeah, yeah 5 mm vsd in a small infant is very large 5 mm vsd in an adult is very small so it is compared to the age of the patient and also compared to the aortic annulus of the patient again aortic annulus is a variable target for example in a patient with something like yeah tetralogy of pharo aortic annulus may be too large that you cannot compare that with aortic annulus similarly a patient with a hypoplastic left ventricular outflow tract with a subaortic membrane subaortic stenosis and a smaller aorta you cannot again compare with the aortic annulus so in a, in a patient who is having a subaortic stenosis with a, a narrowed aortic annulus the 3 mm uh, midmuscular ventricular septal defect may still functionally be a very small ventricular septal defect only it doesn't mean that uh you know if that is about 75% of the aortic annulus that should be called as a, a moderate to large vsd so aortic annulus is a variable target and so that is one of the reason why always the sizing is not compared to aortic annulus but sometimes you know you have to use your discretion so size is dependent on the age and on the aortic annulus then on the number single multiple easy to understand 
then according to the plane, is it a simple VSD that means in the same plane or is it a malaligned VSD? So the types of the treatments available before going into transcathetes and surgery, let us just see what are the types of treatment that are available. In general, people believe giving diuretics for a short period of time, maybe between three to six months, is worth it because of the very high incidence of spontaneous reduction in the size of these ventricular septal defects, both perimembranous and muscular, in the earlier part of the infancy. We will come to that curve later. So there is a justification in giving diuretics in smaller babies, digoxin. While digoxin has been proven to be a very valuable agent in heart failure associated with atrial fibrillation or with the dilated ventricles, in patients with ventricular septal defects in infancy, often the ventricular function is well preserved. Left ventricle may be dilated but not, uh, not dilated markedly in spite of that. There is a definite symptomatic improvement by giving digoxin and so people justify giving digoxin. AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers both have been tried with an intention to reduce the systemic vascular resistance thereby reducing the left reaction. Again, with clear-cut logic behind the therapy, however, substantial improvement in the clinical findings are not present. However, again, a justifiable form of treatment. Much more rarer type of treatment is beta blocking. Even though in heart failure, we all know that drugs like carbidilol, metoprolol, bisoprolol have been proven to alter the sympathetic nervous outflow, which leads to reduction in the tachycardia and thereby causing an, sub, an, an objective improvement in the neurohumoral activation of the cardiovascular system. The drugs that have been tried in ventricular septal defects in congenital heart disease are largely propranol. So what they have done is have identified that reducing the heart rate and prolonging the diastolic filling time, thereby reducing the myocardial oxygen consumption has been proven to be of some symptomatic improvement. Then supplements. Supplements are macronutrient supplements and micronutrient supplements. Macronutrient supplements because they are basically catechetic. They are nutritionally deprived. So macronutrient supplement and micronutrient, iron deficiency is going to cause problems, folate deficiency, vital deficiency. Transcatheter management is applicable in certain forms of self perimembranous VSD, muscular VSD and rarer types of outlet VSD. You will find a lot of literature from the eastern part of the world like Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, where a lot of outlet VSDs have been closed by transcatheter management. It is not applicable in malaligned VSD, inlet VSD, and large duplicated VSDs. Surgery, most common treatment adopted. In basically, in transcatheter VSD, the dictum is there should be a convincing shunt. It is very difficult to define a convincing shunt. So, we're going by logics of clinical examination, the clinical cardiomegaly, the flow mid diastolic movement. Chest X-ray showing an increased cardiothoracic ratio for the given age of the patient. We know that the age of, depending on the age of the patient, the size of the heart varies. It may be around 60% in early infancy within the first two months, 55% between two months to one year, and more than 50% in more than one year. Associated with plethora, echocardiography showing clear cut left atrial and left ventricular volume overload. Whenever there is a left atrial or left ventricular volume overload, that is an indicator that the shunt will be more than 1.5 is to 1. Left ventricle looking just significantly larger than the right ventricle on an apical four chamber view is a simple evidence. Left ventricle Z score of aortic valve should not have a significant prolapse and should not have a significant aortic regurgitation. In order to have a safer catheter passage with more than 8 to 12 kilograms is advocated, but always there will be exceptions. Rarely you might come across a child who is about 3.5 kilograms, discrete coaptation, presenting with extreme bronchopneumonia, and who has been on ventilator. You are going to dilate the coaptation in order to improve the heart failure. Incidentally, the child also has got a ventricular septal defect which is about 3.5 to 4 milliliter and causing a torque and that VSD sometimes may have to be addressed on the same time. 
So you are you are breaking the rule. So there will be some cases where you will be breaking the exceptions and you will be going in. But by and large, these are the dictums of transcathy through the SD closure. Lots of chalk. Yeah, yeah. The traditional device that has been used originally was the asymmetric membranous VSD, which is shown here, which has got a flattened aortic end and an elongated left ventricular epical end. Right ventricular end is more symmetrical. Then the symmetric VSD device, which does this, this the, the, the flattening of the aortic margin is not there. Septal defect, which has got a problem. We know that the waist is only 3 millimeters in a membranous VSD, but in a muscular VSD, it's almost 7 millimeters. Then the duct occluder 1, the duct occluder 2. There are certain devices that were coming up in the de designs, the Senju asymmetric VSD device type 2. We'll come to it later. But the design was frozen due to patent issues. And then various other types of devices that you will see, like tech multifunction, VSD occluder, again the approval is pending. Varieties of Chinese vendors, the Chinese are very innovative. What they have done is, a muscular ventricular septal defect has been designed with 5 millimeter waist, 7 millimeter waist, 10 millimeter waist. They have made the left ventricular disc 2 millimeter larger, 4 millimeter larger than the right ventricular disc. They have made various types of eccentric designs. So, I mean, plenty of designs are going to be available for different morphologies of VSD. The choice of the device will depend on presence or absence of aneurysm number one, anatomical size of the VSD number two, extent of the separation from the aortic valve number three, and how many exits are there in the right ventricular side number four. So, this will be the criteria for deciding what are the types of devices that you will be putting in. So asymmetric device is basically customized to address the flattened superior end so that it doesn't protrude into the aorta. The protrusion of the left ventricular disc on the aortic margin is less than 0.5 millimeter and that is compensated by a protrusion of the disc on the left ventricular side towards the left ventricular apex which is 5.5 millimeter and in order to identify this area there is a small platinum marker that has been welded in the epical end of the device. So this is the classical perimembranous VSD. You can appreciate a small platinum marker here. You can appreciate the flattening of the LV disc on the aortic margin. And you can appreciate that it is protruding a little bit more towards the left ventricular apex. If I magnify that, you can see that this is the aortic margin is sort of flush with the aortic valve and the LV disc is protruding down in the apex. So the choice of the device, absolutely no aortic margin, mostly will need an asymmetric device. We will be able to get away by putting some sort of asymmetric device like a duct occluders and pressing on the aortic valve leaflets, which in the acute phases may not cause any problem with the aortic valve function. However, with the chronicity of the device, some fibrosis sets in in these leaflets and slowly they will either get perforated or they might get fibrosed and immobile, thereby resulting in late onset of aortic regurgitation. Whenever there is a good aortic separation, then we will have plenty of devices, symmetric device, ADO1, ADO2, muscular VSD and all sorts of occluders can be tried. So this is a patient with absolutely no septal aneurysm at all and it is flush with the aortic valve. You can also appreciate a subtle degree of right coronary cusp protrusion into the device. So in these cases, it will be possible not to touch the aortic valve only by using a symmetric device. You can appreciate the symmetric device as the flattening of the aortic side and so that is the logic behind using the symmetric device. Now, that can be identified on a parasternal long axis view by a subtle aortic nipping that you are able to see here. And when you are putting in the device, if you look at very close section, the protruding prolapsing border is actually buttressed or supported by the flattened aortic end of the device. And so that is how this device will show to be more effective 
than the other symmetric sort of device. So you can appreciate another patient. So you can you can see that I I'll freeze it at the appropriate time. You can see how the prolapsing aortic margin is being buttressed by this flattened aortic disc of, of the, on the left ventricular side, and that is actually supporting the leaflet. Symmetric devices can be used whenever there is a septal aneurysm. This is a symmetric device. You can see that the left ventricular and right ventricular discs are located uh, are of, of the same size, and the ADO1 device can be deployed in, in patients where there is a separation. And similarly, it, when there is, see, we can appreciate here, there is no aortic protrusion because there was a clear cut margin that was separating the ventricular septal defect. And the ADO2 devices also can be deployed whenever there is a good separation from the aortic margin. Whenever we have multiple openings, we may have to employ one or two devices across each of the opening. Very often in such cases, we either try out the ADO2 devices or ADO1 device. Which device and which type of VSD? So basically, if there is no aneurysm and the VSD is flush with the aortic annulus, it makes logic to try an asymmetric device. As I told earlier, you may be able to come out with any device that is protruding into the aortic valve with a normal aortic valve function in the temporary period. With long-term repeated motion of the aortic valve leaflets, we are not very sure whether the leaflet will get perforated or the leaflet may get fibrosed. If there is an aneurysm tissue that separates from the aortic annulus and the hole is very small, ADO2 is a good choice because it is very simple to use. Aneurysm tissue with multiple exits, then two ADO2 devices. If the exits are more than six millimeters, then two ADO1 devices. Any hole that is more than 6 millimeter, an ADO1 device, more than 6 millimeter, all the other devices also can be tried. A symmetric membranous VSD device, a muscular VSD device. Basically, three techniques of how you do this. Formation of an atrioventricular loop and delivery from the right ventricle. Formation of an atrioventricular loop and delivery from the jugular vein. And direct arterial delivery. So this is a femoral arterial catheter that goes down, crosses the ventricular septal defect, and the sheath has been introduced across that atrioventricular loop. The sheath is now ready in the left ventricle for taking the device. This is the conventional route. Sometimes it will be through a jugular route. Very often it is used in acquired ventricular septal defects in adults, like you can see the sternal wires. This is an adult with the CABG having an MI and the VSD. So this is delivered from the Jugular. This sometimes will be needed in congenital ventricular septal defects also if there is an anterior muscular VSD or an epical muscular VSD. So this is a large epical, large anterior muscular VSD which is being closed through the jugular axis after a rail roading from the uh, from the venous uh, uh, from the arterial catheter. Direct arterial delivery is very commonly used for ADO2 devices. However, this actually this started with muscular VSD device. People from Europe, when there is a high incidence of heart block in perimembranous VSD using the asymmetric devices, they started to use muscular VSD retrogradely from the aorta using a sheet, crossing the VSD directly from the sheet from the aorta through the LV into the RV and deploying the muscular VSD. So this was the original concept that came up in the late 1990s and subsequently the same thing was adopted for ADO2 devices also. The basic steps in the procedure, you first do a left ventricular angiogram. The best view to identify the perimembranous ventricular septal defects are shallow LIO cranial. Shallow means left anterior oblique around 40 to 45 and cranial around 30. The cranial has to be a little bit more steeper. So this makes it important to understand in what views which VSDs are going to show up. A typical perimembranous VSD will show up at LAO 40 to 45 and steeper cranial up around 30. If there is an inlet muscular ventricular septal defect, it will be LAO 40. That means you are reducing the LAO and increasing the cranial, cranial 40. This is also called as hepatoclavicular view 
or long axial view. Different books might give different names. In mid and apical muscular VSD, LAO 60 and cranial 20, this is the standard left ventricular angiographic view. This is also used for all the patients like tetralogy of fallow, a very large conoventricular ventricular septal defect. In all those patients, LAO 60, cranial 20 is the standard view. Outlet VSDs, you can do lateral cranial, that means 90 degree with cranial of 20 or RAO 30. In any residual ventricular septal defects, after a post-operative VSD closure has been done in a central VSD, then you look at LAO 60, cranial 20. So after crossing the ventricular septal defect from the arterial side, putting in the wire towards the right side, you snare it. Sometimes you snare it from the pulmonary artery. Sometimes you allow the wire to cross to the superior vena cava and snare it from the superior vena cava. After snaring it, form the arterial venous loop, take the sheath and kiss the right coronary catheter which is coming from the arterial end and without exposing the bad wire, take this combination that is the catheter and the sheet together across the ventricular septal defect which by and large does not traumatize the AV nodal conduction tissue and get it into the descending thoracic aorta. Once you have reached the descending thoracic aorta, there are two ways in which you can deploy the device. One is forming a loop and getting the sheath into the left ventricular apex or directly deploying from the aorta. Even directly deploying from the aorta has been proven not to injure the aortic valve leaflets because the aortic valve leaflets keep on moving 70 to 140 times with each cardiac cycle in a minute. And so it is very difficult for the leads to be consistently be trapped by a device that is crossing the aortic valve and entering the left ventricular outflow tract. By the time we are bringing the device towards the aortic valve, the aortic valve might be moving 10 to 15 times so that it, will, it is very unlikely to be trapped within the device. So once we have got into the left ventricle, then expose the left ventricular side of the defect. You can use angiographic confirmation to see the position or sometimes echocardiographic confirmation. So this is a transesophageal echocardiogram that is being done. You can use thoracic echocardiogram, you can do angiograms. You can connect the pressure, the, the sheath to the side, um, side arm of the sheath to the pressures and you can see that then we are crossing from the left ventricle to right ventricle. So the multiple ways in which you can uh, position the device. Once the device is in good position, then release the device and withdraw the sheet. So this is the, this is basically the steps of a uh, transfemoral VSD device closure. What is the harm of this device? This eccentric device has been made in such a way that the aortic disc is smaller, only about 0.5, and the left ventricular disc is longer, that is 5.5 millimeter, whereas uniformly the right ventricle disc is only 3 millimeter all around. The two problems associated with this devices are, there is a very high radial stress due to eccentricity of the device. When you are molding the nitinol wires to make intentionally the ends eccentric, that means the central end on the right side is in the center of the device and the central end of the left side of the device is in a very eccentric manner and you are trying to retain the memory of this device by thermal treatment, you are going to have excessive radial stress so the device is going to try to protrude itself and regain back its full memory after deployment. So this radial stress is going to be far higher. In order to understand radial stress, radial stress probably will be the least in an ADO2 device and it will progressively keep on increasing with the asymmetry of the device. Radial stress is related to the thickness of the wire, the symmetricity of the device. So a device like an ADO1 will also have a higher radial stress than ADO2 because of the wire thickness. A device like an eccentric device will have a higher radial stress because of the eccentricity of the device. Then there is something called as the clamp force. Clamp force is there is a left ventricular disc and there is a right ventricular disc and they are separated only by 3 millimeters. 
we know that the ventricular septum is at least 6 to 10 millimeters in its thickness and so a 6 to 10 millimeter thickness of the portion where the membranous VSD, mer membranous VSD's epical margin merges with the muscular ventricular septum, there is going to be a clamp between the LV and RV discs and both are going to squeeze on the AV nodal conduction tissue which will be coursing along the post inferior margin. So these are the problems. What was the data on these VSD devices? The first report from asymmetric device came up in 2005. Constituted 186 patients. There were two patients with complete heart block or in other words, 1% of them had a complete heart block, but it recovered. There was no need for a pacemaker. So it was not recognized at all. At the time, it was just thought that there are two heart blocks, one person, it's not of any consequence. Then Jack then public published a multi-centered data with 32 patients. Again, one of the patients had a complete heart block. That patient needed a pacemaker. Again, they did not raise the warning bell about the possibilities of device hurting baby node. European Heart Journal then published in 2007, that is two years after the first publication of the Mazuras report, and that published 430 patients, of which 250 were perimembranous VSD, and they got an incidence of 16 patients developing complete heart block. 12 out of 250 of this perimembranous VSD developed complete heart block, and they named it as 5%. Among this 12, six were transient, six were permanent. Because of their protocols, they had to put in 10 patients permanent pacemaker among this total of 16, which means a total of 3.8% of that group needed pacemaker. And this put the brake on the whole program of tennis VSD device process. This was the this was uh, yeah, the publication that triggered discontinuation of the device. And by the end of 2007, the perimembranous VSD closure was no longer acceptable in the United States of America. At the same time, Jack also published an Italian specific data, which they published on 104 patients who developed, six of them developed a complete heart block, more or less again coming to 5 to 6 percent incidence. But when they changed to a muscular VSD device, they identified that the incidence markedly reduced. And then they started to identify that it is the clamp force and the radial stress of the device which was responsible for the complete heart block. So then the muscular VSD device now is a preferred device in places where our VSD closure is done in the developed nations. This has got a separation of 7 millimeters, so there is no clamp force. And it is a symmetric device, so the radial stress is marginally lesser than an eccentric device. This is often deployed retrogradely. So after delineating the left ventricular angiography, then you pass a sheet and put in the device retrogradely. So in this process, you don't take the yeah, arteriovenous loop at all. Whenever there are multiple exits, this is a patient with a septal aneurysm with a multiple exit. What you do is cross the defects one by one, position your first device, and then release it then make another additional angiography and in that angiography locate the second device, second defect and then you identify that that is superior. So then target wire into that superior defect and put in another device. So this is the second device that is coming up. The second device is easy to position because of the previous device acting as a fluoroscopic landmark and once you have deployed the second device also, then do the check angiography. And most of the time, because the discs are filling the septal aneurysm, you will end up in a complete closure of the ventricular septal defect. One of the devices that was studied was the Senjut perimembranous VSD device design number two. So basically the difference is it has got a longer flange on the anterior and posterior surface, a smaller flange so that it doesn't press on the iota, and a broader separation between the left and the right ventricular disc so that there is no clamp. The whole material is made up of a relatively thinner nitinol, thereby reducing the radial stress. And this device was found 
not to produce any heart blocks at all in the first trial that it was done. However, due to patent related issues, this has again gone out of the market. The complications, you can have arrhythmias during the procedure. You often it is ventricular repeated ectopics or ventricular reflux of tachycardia due to the sheath and wire place, speed placements, usually benign and they are transient. Heart block will come to it a little later. Valvular regurgitation. You can impinge on either the aortic valve or tricuspid valve and may produce aortic or tricuspid regurgitation. Device embolization if you are wrongly sizing. Air embolization during the procedure hemolysis if there is a residual flow. Sometimes if in the process of the crossing of the wires, you have injured the pericardial effusions and hemopericardium, vascular access related complications. These are the problems that you can get due to VSD closure. Heart block is due to, it can be early or late. Early is within the first seven days. It is due to direct trauma. You go and hit around the atrioventricular nodal area or the conduction bundle and cause a traumatic injury. There will be associated inflammation caused by the trauma and also a hemorrhage due to the trauma which will worsen over the next three to seven days and lead to complete heart block. They respond to steroid. The risk factors of this heart block is younger the age because more chances of injury in the younger child, smaller the weight, down syndrome, inlet extension, a very long distance from the aortic anus. When there is a long aortic margin, we are very happy because we feel that the VSD device is not going to encroach on the aortic valve. But they have identified that perimembranous VSD is the longest aortic margin or at the highest risk of complete heart block. What is the reason? The Perimembranous VSD is defined as the VSD that is located in the aortotricuspid fibrous continuity. So, in a place where you are having the VSD should be related to the aorta and should be related to the tricuspid valve in the region of aortotricuspid continuity. And there, if you are having a separation from the aorta, obviously it means it is closer to the tricuspid valve. So, that it is having inlet extension. Shorter distance from the septal tricuspid leaflet and choosing a very large device. The device to defect ratio should not be more than two. So if you are choosing a very large device, then again you might have a problem of complete heart block. Late complete heart block occurs after seven days. Sometimes has been reported even after eight to 10 years. It is due to progressive fibrosis, caused by clamp force and radial stress, and may need permanent pacemaker implantation. Let me also tell you one more thing. Now there is an increasing literature about incidence of heart block that happens in patients with ventricular septal defect over a long run due to varieties of genes that involve TBX5 and NKX2.5. So these genes not only code for the morphological abnormalities in the heart that includes ventricular septal defects, they also code for abnormal conduction tissue pathways and early degeneration of these conduction tissue pathways. More and more complete heart blocks that has been identified in patients who have been operated for ventricular septal defects many, many years ago have been identified to be due to certain genetic abnormalities in this morphogenesis of the atrioventricular nodal conduction tissue. So while today it seems reasonable to accuse a ventricular septal defect device are a ventricular septal patch and its associated fibrosis for occurrence of a heart block that may happen few years after the closure. Over a period of time, we might be understanding that there may be a genetic predisposition of certain group of people for an accelerated AV nodal injury in this subset of patients. Muscular ventricular septal defects are another group of ventricular septal defects where device closures are useful. It's classified as anterior muscular, mid muscular, posterior muscular, epical muscular. It may be single or multiple. It may be large or small. So this is an anterior muscular VSD in a parasternal short axis view. And this is a posterior muscular VSD in a subsified view. In all these ventricular septal defects, this is a posterior muscular VSD and here is an anterior muscular VSD. So in all these views, 
we can, this is mid muscular vst in all these muscular ventricular septal defects device closure has been accepted as a method of choice in view of lack of identification of the margins of the vst during surgical explorations and so muscular vsds have traditionally been accepted as suitable candidates for transcatheter vsd closure and the closure involves more or less the same principle so this is a large mid muscular vsd being closed by a large muscular vsd device sometimes you may use a ado1 device also for very large muscular ventricular septal defects because the flow is from left to right the keeping a larger disc on the left ventricle and relatively smaller disc on the right ventricle will still make the device relatively stable whenever there are multiple epical ventricular septal defects we may have to use multiple devices so these are two ado1 devices that are going through through femoral venous pathways outlet ventricular septal defects are rarely treated you will see more and more literature from the chinese data and this is an outlet vsd that is closed by an asymmetric device and you can see this is in ramo view and this is the ventricular this is the left ventricle right ventricular outflow tract the pulmonary valve here and this is an outlet vsd so to summarize transcatheter option is possible in relatively small to moderate sized vsds perimembranous muscular and rare outlet vsds can be closed by device closure when there is no aortic margin you use asymmetric devices but when there is aortic margin many options exist the achilles heel of this procedure is complete heart block and late occurrence should be looked for surgical vsd closure surgical can be grouped into hybrid surgical and pure surgical what is hybrid surgical hybrid surgical is basically during the surgery not utilizing a patch but using a device so you can use a perventricular vsd device which means in a small infant with a large muscular ventricular septal defect you can puncture the anterior wall of the right ventricle position a wire through the vsd sheet through the vsd and close the ventricular septal defect with a device and close the post string through which you have entered into the vsd from the right ventricular anterior wall then there is a minimal access perventricular wherein you don't open the chest at all you go through right anterolateral thoracotomy or left anterolateral thoracotomy access the right ventricular surface of the heart put a post string and then enter and then there is a third variety called open surgical device closure where you open the heart you expose the muscular septum identify the vsd but then don't close the vsd with a patch you pass a guide wire through the vsd directly pass a sheet position the device and and secure the device in the correct position because the device has got conformability so it will go on conform itself to various shapes of a muscular vsd thereby achieving a better closure surgical closure has been patch closure either single or double in some patients with a malaligned vsd we may have to use two patches ptfe or dacron or pericardial material can be used sometimes it may be direct plugetted closure the access to the vsd usually is from the right ventricular side but in multiple muscular cystis ventricular septal defect sometimes you might go through the left ventricle also there is also another method called as right ventricular reticular exclusion there are multiple cystis type of ventricular septal defects entering into the right ventricular apex which is completely not visible for surgical field at all then you go through the tricuspid valve and just exclude the entire right ventricular apex by a large patch that runs at the level of moderator band thereby pushing all the ventricular septal defects distal to the patch the right ventricular apex will become now part of the left ventricle where is the conduction bundle this is of importance for all the pediatric cardiologists when you are selecting a patient for a procedure this is a perimembranous ventricular septal defect which is in the region of aorto tricuspid fibrous continuity this is the aortic valve this is the tricuspid valve aorto tricuspid fibrous continuity and in all these the conduction bundle courses along the posterior inferior margin 
So in these areas, the sutures has to be very careful. That is, if the same patient is having an outlet ventricular septal defect wherein the device actually moves away from the region of aortotricuspid fibrous continuity, then the muscular rim separates the conduction bundle from the postro inferior margin. So if you are having a pure outlet VSD, you will not have the conduction tissue. But you are having an outlet VSD with a perimembranous extension, then the situation will be like this where you will share it with the posterior, posteroinferior margin. In patients in whom there is an inlet muscular ventricular septal defect, an inlet muscular ventricular septal defect will have the conduction bundle along the anterior margin of the ventricular septal defect. And then in patients with outlet VSD with perimembranous extension, Perimembranous VSD with uh, outlet VSD with perimembranous extension, you will have that passing through the postromedial region. Now, in patients in whom there is a straddling of the tricuspid valve, so you can see that there is a straddling of the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is committed 50% to the left ventricle and 50% to the right ventricle. This is the muscle receptor. Now, here the AV node will lose its connection in the region where the triangle of puck is there. A separate node will happen at posterior and lateral to the tricuspid valve and penetrate the AV nodal bundle. So in these patients, the AV node will not be located in the triangle of cock at all and it will be located completely posterior and lateral. In patients where there is a complete inlet ventricular septal defect, the conduction bundle will be across the crest of the ventricular septal defect. The crest of the ventricular septal defect is actually the Epical margin of the ventricular septal defect. So these are the places where the conduction system will be there in the VSD. This has to be taken care of during the surgery. The surgical approaches are trans tricuspid approach, which is the commonest approach. You visualize through the tricuspid valve and close it. Sometimes you may detach the septal tricuspid leaflet or the posterior tricuspid leaflet in order to get a better visualization of the margins. Sometimes you may do it trans right ventriculotomy. In patients in whom there are multiple muscular ventricular septal defects, sometimes you might do a trans left ventriculotomy. In patients in whom there are multiple epical VSDs, you might do a hockey stick incision along the right side of the LAD. That means bring a long incision on the right side of the LAD and turn it towards the right ventricular apex and expose the VSD. And then trans pulmonary VSD will be done in subpulmonic ventricular septal defect. Surgical technique. Quite commonly nowadays we use continuous sutures, but in very small newborn babies it is better to use interrupted sutures. Advantage of continuous suture is that it simplifies the surgery and quickens the surgery. You can complete the suturing within a few minutes, but using the interrupted suture will make it time consuming. But the problem is when you are using a continuous suture you might end up in higher tension of the suture line, thereby resulting in the sutures cutting through in a newborn and in a very young infant, thereby causing a higher incidence of residual VSD. So interrupted sutures are more often preferred in newborns and young infants. Continuous sutures are acceptable in an older patient. Sometimes the, su the suturing is done partially through the tricuspid valve and partially through the right ventricle depending on the visibility of the VSD. The suturing is done sometimes through the edges of the ventricular septal defect or sometimes along the right ventricular side of the VSD. People who suture along the right ventricular side of the VSD claim that the conduction bundle will be passing through the edge of the VSD and so we are avoiding that. But people who are suturing through the edge of the VSD will say that they will be passing their sutures only through the thinner endocardial area rather than going deeper into the muscle and hence the chances of injury is going to be low. You can find publications that are advocating closure of VSD through the edge of the VSD with a completely no incidence of complete heart block at all. And also you will find a good number of publications of suturing along the right ventricle side of the VSD and quoting the similar reasons. So basically it is a technical area where you are putting the suture lines. 
complete versus partial closure. In patients in whom you are anticipating pulmonary vascular disease, you want not a complete closure, but a partial closure. So a pulmonary vascular disease is identified by Keith Edwards classification, where in the pulmonary arterioles, there is medial hypertrophy without any significant intimal change, which is grade 1. A medial hypertrophy with progressive intimal hyperplasia, that is grade 2. A medial hypertrophy with intimal hyperplasia, intimal fibrosis, and minimal dilatation of the pulmonary arterioles, grade 3. Progressive more and more vasodilatation, grade 4, with certain vessels being completely occluded by the intimal hypertrophy and intimal hyperplasia and fibrosis and there will be few plexiform lesions. In grade 5, there will be more and more plexiform lesions, cavernous changes, angiomatoid changes, and grade 6 is necrotizing arthritis. So, basically, the progressive pulmonary vascular disease goes through this histology. Whenever the histology is worse than grade 4 to grade 6, it may not be a good idea to achieve a complete closure, and so there is a role for partial closure. Partial closure is done by leaving behind a fenestration in the VST patch or using a flap valve and trying to make it unidirectional. So in hypertensive VST, these strategies can be treat and close. That means you give pulmonary vasodilators for a few months to few years and then close. Or close and treat. That means you go ahead and close it and then continue pulmonary vasodilator. You can use a pulmonary artery band in order to reduce the amount of shunt and thereby trying to prevent the remodeling of the vessels, a partial closure, a flap valve closure. Sometimes you even take some assessment on table. So you open the chest, take a lung frozen section biopsy, wait for the lung frozen section biopsy to see whether it is grade 4, grade 5, grade 6, and if it is so, then abandon the procedure and come out. If the lung frozen section biopsy is 1, 2, or 3, then go ahead and close. There are also people who do assess on table by endothelial circulating progenitor cells. So on the day of the surgery, you take the child into the theater, put the child on cardiopulmonary bypass, and start taking the blood sample and identify for these circulating progenitor cells. Higher levels of progenitor cells indicates that higher levels of pulmonary vascular disease, and so then back out. So these are various uh, methods in which people address the hypertensive VSD. About the timing of VSD closure, we know that there is a large ventricular septal defect. Why can't we close it right at infancy? Because we have achieved great levels of surgical expertise now. What has been found is patients who are having a very, very, very large VSD within the first three months a substantial number of them reduce in their size. So, if you are able to find a child who is having a large perimembranous VSD at, say, one month or 15 days, it doesn't mean that patient automatically becomes a candidate for a surgical VSD closure because 50% of them are going to become significantly smaller at the end of third month itself. So, there is a point in deferring the surgery and giving a chance of the medical management that I was mentioning earlier, which includes diuretics, maybe digoxin, maybe AC inhibitors and ARBs, maybe beta blockers, and maybe nutritional supplementation. But this curve also tells another story. If you keep on looking at this, it keeps on reducing, 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 but then it reaches a plateau. Beyond around three years, it continues to plateau. So that means about 10% of the patients are never going to close at all. And these patients may continue to remain like this. If you remain on permanent follow-up, these patients will never get closed and you are going to have a heart which is volume overloaded pulmonary hypertension on a long period. So this is the data that showed that there is a spontaneous closure of many ventricular septal defects. You will identify that whenever you are doing the study in very young infancy, Within a short period of follow-up, only about 20 to 30% close. If you extend the follow-up, more and more numbers close. This is two-thirds close when you extend the surgery study for five years. You extend the study for about 10 years, around 75% close. You do it in adolescence, about 40 to 20% of the patients close. You do it in primarily in adults, only 4 to 6% close. 
So what it means is people will continue to remain to have VSD, a small proportion, anywhere between 10 to 20 percent, and they will continue to cause a persistent shunt. And when there is a persistent shunt, it's not going to be totally be benign. A small group will develop progressive aortic regurgitation. A small group will develop infective endocarditis. A small group will develop sudden cardiac events due to progressive LV dilatation. And so this is not so benign to keep on permanently following the patient. When the small ventricular septal defects have been followed up in some of the meticulously followed European nations, American nations, 20% of them were operated for some reasons that included infective endocarditis, aortic valve prolapse, aortic regurgitation, infundibular stenosis, subiotic stenosis, progressive tricuspid regurgitation, sinus of Alsalva aneurysm, LV dilatation, mild PAH, or symptoms. So we need to remember, whenever we are deciding to leave a patient with small ventricular septal defect on medical follow-up, it is very likely that during the follow-up of this child, 20% of these children may at some point of time be taken up for a VSD closure by another cardiologist or by the same person over a period of time for these anatomical indications. Incidence of endocarditis has been reported to be anywhere between 1 to 2 per 1,000 patient years. This is 18.7 by 10,000 patient years, but anywhere between 1 to 2 per 1,000 patient years. In a developing country, when there is infective endocarditis, we need to understand they are more morbid. They are more often culture negative, so you will be using empirical therapies. They are most likely to be under-treated. They are most likely not to be operated and so continue with morbidity. If they are operated, they will have higher mortality. The chances of infective endocarditis every year is going to be somewhere between 0.1 to 0.3%. And people who have got a predisposition to develop infective endocarditis, just like rheumatic fever. A small proportion of patients are predisposed to develop rheumatic fever when they get a group B streptococcus, group A streptococcus tonsillar infection. Similarly, infective endocarditis has also got a predilection. There are certain endothelial factors that invite a thromboembolic initial marantic vegetation, which subsequently gets seeded. <coughs> And so the person who gets one episode of endocarditis is at a much higher incidence of recurrent endocarditis. While we are talking about 0.1 to 0.3 percent per year, if a person gets one episode of endocarditis on a ventricular septal defect, the chances of him recurring is more than 10 percent. So there is a high chance of recurrence and relapse in patients with infective endocarditis. And so one episode of infective endocarditis will be a justifiable indication for closure of the disease. Post-operative problems that come after VSD closures are residual defects, persistent pulmonary hypertension, left ventricular dysfunction due to afterload mismatch, complete heart block, right bundle branch block, bifascicular block, which means right bundle and left anterior bundle, or trifascicular block, that means prolonged PR interval, right bundle and left anterior bundle, lung hyperinflation syndrome, often not clearly understood. If you look at, if you remember your x-rays of all your patients with a large VSD with a large shunt, or maybe tomorrow when you go back to your clinic and look at them, all these lungs are hyperinflated. Reason why they are hyperinflated is because there is a fight for space between the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, and the bronchus within the lung parenchyma, and it is the arteries and veins that win over the airway, and so they cause small airway obstruction. When there is a small airway obstruction that results in filling of the alveolus with the reduced exit of the air from the alveolus, so they will always be in a hyperinflated situation. Now in the post-operative situation, after you have addressed the shunt, the persistent left ventricular dysfunction causes some degree of pulmonary venous hypertension and the pulmonary arterioles do not reduce in their space instantaneously. So these children continue to have a lung hyperinflation and you will continue to have crackly sounds on the chest, some degree of respiratory distress, some persistent wrong type, 
some persistent need for bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. And it's quite common in clinical practice to appreciate that a child who has been operated for a VSD is not going to be so simply be going back home, but it's going to take another two to three months to settle down on this lung. So this is what is called as the lung hyperinflation syndrome. More often well understood by the cardiac surgeons than by the cardiologists. Infections at various levels, wound infection, endocarditis, lung infections, catheter-related urinary infections, varieties of infections, and pump and anesthesia-related problems. These are the post operative problems. So in a nutshell, this is an outline about the various strands catheter and surgical management of a ventricular septal disease. Any, any questions? I don't know how all these pop-ups come